Welcome back to the It's Just For podcast pay for review. I'm Joanna Reardon, and we're obviously here to bring you the latest in sports news this week. It's been an absolute roller coaster of, I think, emotions, of uh, record breaking, everything else that's been going on at the minute. Neve, I know you have a lot to tell us about the Athletics at the weekend because you were absolutely glued to your screen while I was busy doing other stuff, which wasn't <laughs> as exciting. Neve, t- give us the lowdown. Tell us what's been going on in the athletics world. Yeah, the athletics results have been phenomenal at the moment. Obviously, we spoke a bit about middle distance running last week. Um, I'm going to give people a heads up now. We are going to be talking about athletics for a little while. So if you want to skip forward, um, whether it's on podcast, we're going to put the time stamps underneath in the description. And on video, we'll have it all time stamped as well. So if you want to uh, quickly glaze over the athletics news, uh, we won't take any offence and you can skip on to the next pieces. Um, basically, the Irish Life Health Micro Meet happened over the weekend. There was a select few athletes were invited to it. Um, it was a really well organized event and seemed to go very successfully. All the athletes were commending the organization of it. Um, in some events, there were two competitors, and then in some more events, I know in the um, some of the sprints, there were two heats and that. So it was good that they had a, a bit of variety and opportunity for the athletes to come out and race. Um, The purpose of the event really was to allow other athletes to make those European indoor standards, um, as well as giving people that are on track to Tokyo uh, and that have made the European standard uh, racing opportunity as well. So I think that's important uh, to give people the opportunity to sharpen up for for racing that's coming down the track. Obviously, we've been telling people that the middle distance athletes are on fire and they brought the heat this week. I'm going to go straight to the 800 metres and give you the lowdown of what happened. Uh, It was a very exciting race and certainly didn't unfold, I think, um, as was expected. The commentators on the uh, YouTube live stream with Athletics Ireland (laughs) certainly uh, expected a couple of different things to happen. But Sinead Denny was on pacemaking duties, um, so she took the lead out. She was followed by Georgie Hardigan and Claire Mooney and they, they went with her for a while um, while Katie Kirk and some of the other girls seemed to kind of sit back on it a little bit and go with a slightly steadier approach, I think. Um, it was expected that Hardigan and Mooney would start to move back because the pace was um, pretty quick at the start and that then the others would move up the field so you'd start to see it, uh, you know, the gap close. Um, Claire did drop back uh, Hardigan kept going. So Sinead Denny obviously like stepped off. Uh, Georgie Hardigan was still running. And then in the last lap with like 200 to go, um, you know, the gap the gap had closed. Louise Shannon and Isolde O'Donnell made ground. And we were just wondering like in, in the last kind of 100, was uh, Hardigan going to hold on to the win? And was she going to be able to maintain that pace? But she actually, she held on really, really strong. And she crossed in a time of 2.01. I don't know if it was 48 or 58, but it was 201 something, um, which moved her momentarily onto um, the all-time list and she was in second place. But that didn't last very long because she for Claire Butner was in action in the States and she actually held the 800 meter Irish indoor record up until three weeks ago when Nadia broke it. And initially Nadia broke it by... 0.02 of a second and then obviously she kicked it on forward to two minutes uh, 0.58 um, so basically what happened was Shifra obviously saw kind of what's going on she's in good form at the moment anyway she ran a 1500 meter PB uh, recently as well so she's definitely on form so a couple of hours after the Irish micro meet happens in Dublin Shifra goes running and she goes and runs uh, to 58 sorry I made a mistake there. Uh, Nadia's time was two minutes 0.98. So Shifra moved the time to two minutes 0.58. Yep. So Nadia Power had uh, the Irish indoor record for a grand total of three weeks until <laughs> Shifra decided I'm going to take this back. Um, so it's all very exciting. Several of the 800 meter athletes have made um, European indoors times, but only three athletes are actually allowed to compete. So um, it came down to basically who who has run the fastest times. Uh, in the last week, five different athletes have run the five fastest runs in Irish history. So that's Shifra, Nadia, Isol O'Donnell, Georgie Hardigan, and Louise Shanahan. Four of these are now inside the top 20 world rankings, and that's more than any other country at the moment. So it is a very exciting time for 800 metres at the moment, and we certainly look forward to the uh, European indoor 
members. I mean, the people that will be going for the European indoors will be uh, Shifra, Nadia, and Georgie Hardigan. So it'll be exciting to see them in action. Yeah, like it's absolutely crazy. Like, I mean, I was, I'm obviously part of my Irish Times column for this week is basically asking like, why is this happening like now? Um, and like, what's going on in like the world of athletics? And like, I think I've seen a lot of commentary on social and I just kind of wanted to get your opinion on it before we moved into the sprinters. Um, but I've seen a lot of commentary on social basically going on about, you know, the new spikes are obviously playing, you know, something. Then, you know, I think Sinead Galvin had like tweeted that basically because the athletes were in training camps for such a long time, they didn't have any meets to keep disturbing their camps kind of over and over and over again. So therefore they were more finely tuned in order to kind of go forward. You know, I saw her getting a little bit, um, especially Galvin of Galvin Sports Management, she reps some of the girls, uh, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, I know she got a little bit ratty with someone online who basically said, is there other things that are at play? Um, you know, different things like that. I think, look, we're always going to have people hopping into athletics and going, you know, everyone's doping. There's no point mm -hmm. having athletics. Like, it is what it is. I personally, I think I'm kind of with everyone in that. I don't know, are the girls, like, wearing the shoes? Like, I'm not really too sure because I wouldn't be that level of, like, in-depth. You would obviously know a bit better. Uh, but I think really for me, I think a lot of it from even listening to the girls, like talking to Amy, talking Amy O'Donoghue, talking to Michelle Fain, who lives down the road for me, um, talking to even Nadia um, and Phil Healy and all these girls. I think really they were just, they knew that the times for achievement were limited and they knew that the fallback was going to be hard if they didn't make it. So I just feel like a lot of them did put everything, like all it in, into one basket and just went absolutely hell for leather uh, with each other. And I think, I wonder if like that made the difference. Like, I wonder if it was the shoes. I wonder if it was just the lack of, um, you know, disruption to their camps and different things like that. Because I think these girls are like, they're jetting everywhere, you know, to go mm -hmm. to meets and different things. But, you know, with COVID that obviously can't happen. Um, I suppose, you know, as we said, the competition for the 800 meters is insane right now. We, myself and Eve don't have the reasons for it. We're just as intrigued as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, but there were a lot of other standout moments at the micro meet. I know you're going to tell us a little bit about the sprinters, Phil Healy, Kate O'Connor, um, Sarah Lavin, all these girls who've been doing yeah. incredible things. Do you want to run through the sprinters? Yeah, well, I guess, like, look, the, the sprinters are wearing the same shoes as, as the middle distance runners. And so basically anybody on the track has access to those uh, to those bikes. Um, what I have been seeing anyway is that uh, Nike New Balance have the carbon plate in them. Um, from what I can tell, Adidas don't and Nadia is an Adidas athlete so yeah. I think in that respect like Shifra's a Shifra's a New Balance athlete um I don't know off the top of my head what the other girls what shoes they were wearing I'm not sure but um when it comes to Shifra she's New Balance and Nadia is Adidas so nobody can take that time away from Nadia if the shoes haven't been developed I have heard that down the line um you know it's to be expected that Adidas and everybody else is going to have um you know the same model and um, in relation to kind of the results, um, I think it's an interesting point and people are kind of discussing it in a lot of sports, like because there has been, like you're saying, these camps and consistent training as opposed to uh, competing back into kind of recovery training, tapering for the next competition, et cetera, et cetera, that has it actually delivered better results. And um, something that I also think needs to be considered is um, people would normally compete and then obviously train and come back and compete again. And usually you would see a kind of a progression of times, but we haven't really seen, and no more than like at um, Irish National Outdoors last year, um, people seem to kind of progress, but they haven't been actually out racing. So when you haven't got people out racing, it's it would be usually a gradual progression where people are now seem, seeming to kind of jump a little bit. And the other thing to kind of keep in mind is like a lot of these athletes are actually training with and against each other in um they have the elite status they're allowed to train so they're going to do time trials in the background just because it's not publicized and it's not an official time doesn't mean that they haven't been around the times in training like i know say amy was doing time trials a while ago and i am um, you know she might do it with one like one other person i know phil and molly scott are training together so like they're always going to be pushing each other pushing each other pushing each other um so just because it wasn't official stand wasn't official times doesn't mean that they haven't been running some of those times in those time trials that they have been practicing in. But going over to the sprinting, I mean, we're mentioning Molly and we're mentioning uh, Phil here now anyway. So yeah, the sprinters are in good form um, from the 60 meter sprint to the 60 hurdles and the 400. Um, with the 60 meters at the 
micro meet, um, the athletes were given two opportunities to run. So they did their first race and then an hour later they did their second race. So it gave them um, an opportunity, I guess, to make those times. Um, in the hurdles, it was just Lavin and heptathlete Kate O'Connor. Lavin had already made the standard. Obviously, we had discussed that already. Um, she made the European indoor standard. Uh, so she's just sharpening up for competition. Um, and then Kate is kind of looking forward to the future combined competitions. So she won't be in action at the indoors. But obviously, she's a um, you know, very high performing athlete. And you, know, you need to kind of make sure that these athletes are getting the opportunity to compete. So Kate was uh, in the hurdles and she was again an action later in some of the other events um, that, are, that are in heptathlon. So she seems to be in really good form, uh, which is great to see. In this uh, 60 meter sprint, uh, Molly Scott won both heats. Uh, she hit the qualifying standard in 7.36. So the qualifying standard was 7.36 and she was bang on the money. Um, in the first attempt, the clock actually came up as uh, 7.37 and everyone was like, oh my God, like she's just right on it. And then they actually kind of checked the official time and she, she got that 7.36. Um, Joan Healy finished second. Uh, she has her ticket to Poland to go to the uh, European indoors as well. Um, Molly won both heats and uh, Joan finished second in both heats. And in the second heat, Molly actually ran 7.37. So she literally was like pretty much the exact same time. So showing consistency across the board. Um, then in the 400 metres, Phil was racing the 400. Uh, 200 metre indoors is not an event at major meets anymore. Uh, obviously, we kind of be used to Phil competing at the 100 and 200 outdoors. And that's what she would be targeting for Tokyo. Um, but she is focusing on the 400 meters for outdoors. She ran the sixth fastest time in Europe and the second uh, and became the second on all time Irish list, uh, running a time of 51.99. So she's certainly in good form and we'll be looking forward to seeing her in action at the European indoors as well. Sophie Becker and Charlene Maudsley also ran in that heat and they booked their tickets to Poland as they dipped under those uh, qualification times and got some opportunity to sharpen up for the event. The field events were run with both genders competing at the same time, which I actually thought was pretty cool. Um, Summer Lecky was in great form and the throwers and long, ju long jumpers also started off their seasons uh, with, with good times, or, sorry, good jumps and good throws. So that'll be something to watch over the next while. Um, I, none of them will be competing at the indoors, um, any of the field events, but um, hopefully as we progress to outdoor season, we'll see them in action again. What's your like random, like, you know, track and field event that you'd be like, I definitely think I could do that. So like mine is pole vault. I always thought when I was younger, I could do the pole vault, like no bother whatsoever. And then I saw a video of this guy. He was obviously like professional, like doing it, um, like going up for the pole and the pole like slipped out of his hand and it like slipped into his shorts and like barely mm. missed, but like, you know, <sighs> millimeters. And then straight out of there, I was like, I'm out, I'm out. I'm not doing the pole. <laughs> and you'd swear like I was doing it every day in my life. I was like, no, it's not for me anymore. Um, but I always feel like I don't know the pole vault is something that I think I absolutely like love to do like the actual thrill and adrenaline like of doing that I think would actually send me over the edge so like if you could compete and like be a pro like what would be your like bizarre event oh I don't know if I'd have a bizarre one I think I'm pretty boring like I did do um a bit of track when I was in secondary school I'm um, just like I did a bit of cross country race and a bit of track so I have a great century at my presence a couple of times but um <laughs> I kind of think I'd like middle distance obviously there's no room for me <laughs> um, everyone's very too fast but um yeah I raced the 800 one year I think I was in fifth year and uh, yeah I was too wide I think it was fifth year to be honest and I um, I just kind of went with the girl that was ahead of me and she uh, she like I never ran for a club rather and I just kind of went with her and um, some of my friends were watching they're like oh who's that other girl that's up with they knew the, the girl that was winning and they're like oh that's me and I was like okay so like whatever came in second and like walked over to my teacher after and I, it was like at the kind of drain like the great drains in Santry and literally just threw up in the drain that was so oh. he was like yeah she's fine she just pushed herself I like had no oh. sympathy I was like yeah I'm fine <laughs> but, but um that's not what you need like at all not the not the uh, I also think the, I also think the triple jump I don't know why I think I'd be good at hop skip no uh, jump. do you know no? sorry oh my god so like I've, I have looked at long jump uh on the track and you don't realize when people are doing it how far you have to actually jump to make it into the sand pit. So while it might look fine, it is a long way. And I personally would not make it into the sand pit. So no, I, I, I don't have 
confidence in myself for any of those events, I will stick to the flat running. But um, steeplechase, I'd say, is a bit of crack if you can get up and over those. But um, my... steeplechase is fine. Yeah, I mean, Michelle Finn obviously does that here near me. Um, Fly it. And Dad literally thought that when lockdown had like come in, because he works with her uncle. So dad literally like went straight up to, to him and was like, oh, does like Michelle like jump hay bales? Like, is that how she's like mm-hmm. doing it now? And it's, uh, when I interviewed her for the Irish Times, I was like, I have to ask a real question that my dad just wants me to ask. I was like, do you actually just jump hay bales to like keep the, you know, run, 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 hop thing kind of going? And she was like, no, she was like, they actually give you a hurdle. So she was like, I have one hurdle that I just practice yeah. like, over and over and over again, which yeah. I kind of found mind blowing. But I actually think that would be a good one too. And I think as well, something, I don't know if it's true. I'd have to ask Michelle Finn. When you kind of jump into like, you know, the, the watery the water, kind of thing, yeah. I wonder would that kind of like semi cool you down? Because you know, sometimes it's nice to just get a splash mm. of cold water, like yeah. as you're like running along. Now, Michelle Unless might you fall say, in. Oh, which, yeah. Yeah. Like my sister did Seaple Chase uh, in Santry, I think in the latter years of her uh, school athletics career. And she, I think, ran it with a friend of hers and they just, um, they were kind of just doing it to do it. Like, and uh, the friend, I think it was her friend, fell over and flattened herself. Like just, she, and she was that viral video um, oh, no. on Facebook at the time. <laughs> Everybody was watching her like, oh my God, I just see her flatten herself. But um, yeah, it was either her friend or, or somebody else from, from their school. Um, that she like, and everybody was like laughing, but sure, look, they uh, were doing it for a laugh. Um, so they didn't really care, do you know? But um, well, Neil, yeah. they won't be they won't be seeing us at the European indoors, no. unfortunately. We did not get our mm-hmm. ticket in our respective pole vault and uh, long or triple jump. But there are a lot of Irish athletes going over to the Europeans because they've just announced the European uh, indoor mm-hmm. team. Who is going? Who is not going? Who should be looking out for? Tell us all the juicy goss when it comes to the European indoors. Yeah, like we've pretty much mentioned, like we've mentioned the bulk of the team already. Um, I think the 800 is the difficult event really because so many actually made the qualifying times and um, don't get to go. Um, so the other people that we haven't mentioned are the 2019 medalists, uh, Kira McGean and semi-finalist Phil Healy. And that was from the 2019 edition of the European Indoors. And then Kira Neville will be competing in the 60 metres and then Michelle Finn will also be competing in the 3K. Um, Louise Shanahan unfortunately did not book her ticket because there were three people that were faster than her. Um, but we will have the World Indoor Final on Wednesday, the 24th of February. Uh, Nadia Power, Louise Shanahan and Sarah Lavin will be competing. That's on in Madrid and will be live on TG Carter, which is quite exciting. Um, so I think that is pretty much the update that we have in athletics. It's a lot. And um, yeah, for all that made it this far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, congrats if you listened to our athletics news. But it was a big one. And, you know, as myself and Neve were saying, um, pre all this in our messages, I think without athletics, we would not have a podcast at this stage. But there actually has been other stuff going on. Um, you know, uh, we've got a lot of exciting news in soccer. Uh, you know, Vera Pau, she is back. She will lead Ireland for another two years after agreeing a contract extension with the FAI. Uh, she will take charge of Ireland's World Cup qualifying campaign um, with those fixtures being announced in April. Obviously, the goal is to finally get to a major championship for the first time in history. As everyone knows, we were agonizingly close to getting into the Euros um, and Anya Garman will hate me mentioning um, her own goal again. Um, but the difference was actually very, very slim. Um, so there has has been a definite shift in taking over uh, since uh, Vera was involved with the Republic of Ireland national team. She was talking on her press conference yesterday about um, letting the underage girls and boys um, compete or even participate in a mixed gender um, facilities. And she wants the girls, uh, the women's national team to have the same facilities as the men's team as well. I actually thought they did have the same. I remember going to Abbottstown for like a training session for them. Um, so I was convinced they were always there, but According to Vera, it's not always like 100% of the time. Um, we obviously are hoping um, to have other major uh, exciting news in terms of our sport and the FAI coming up uh, pretty soon enough. But um, yeah, soccer has been pretty quiet. Um, the Women's National League kicks off very soon. Preseason is underway. And um, yeah, no, we're gradually getting there. I mean, spring has sprung. We are getting sports, Neve. Um, you're going to boxing for us. What's going on in the boxing world? Yeah, so competitive boxing for the Irish is back and uh, currently taking place in Bulgaria. Kelly Harrington, Michaela Walsh, Eva O'Rourke, Neve 
early are all in action. Uh, Harrington, Walsh and O'Rourke are progressing to the next round. So that's great to see that the that the team is doing really, really well. Um, early is yet to fight and uh, we will update you as soon as we can. Make sure to um, tune in to the social media channels and to the website to keep up to date with the, the news and boxing because we will keep you updated with that all week. Harrington is due to fight someone that she will meet at the Tokyo qualifiers in June. So it will be a good measure um, for her to, um, you know, see how she goes against her. And then also to, I guess, do a bit of a recce on her style and that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, look, we we really are hoping that there will be some um, qualifiers for Tokyo. Um, obviously, Ireland has a strong t- tradition of boxing and um, some of these girls are, are really uh, doing well at the moment and a lot of them are very young as well um, so it's great to have the Irish boxers back in action and now you'll tell us a little bit about golf. Golf the greatest sport that ever exists like of all time I know people hate me for saying that but I actually mean it like first of all I love golf I know we want to talk about Lauren Walsh moving into the golf amateurs but yours truly of hersport.ie Joanna Virgin had a big achievement at the weekend. I don't mean to brag. I know Lauren is the better golfer out of all of us, but that's fine. Um, I won at the weekend, guys. I won the Sand Dune Classic on Nintendo Switch PGA 2K1. It was a big achievement for everything. I felt my driving was absolutely on point. Admittedly, I did drive into the water accidentally. I have to say, my hand slipped. My brother called me and I didn't know. My hand slipped. Um, And I was able to set a course record of 16 under. It was just a great day for all involved. I'd like to thank the Hearst Core team for the support that they've given me throughout this um, tumultuous career in my time. I would like to thank all my supporters and I'm looking forward to getting back out there, guys. I'll see you all on Saturday. But in more important news than Joanne's achievements in golf, Lauren Walsh is moving into the golf amateur uh, world's top 20 at the minute. So she finished runner-up at the Palmetto Inter- Intercollegiate Colli- College Competition. Um, her second successive second place um, this month, so absolute kudos to her. She's also taken two victories in the last four months in America and her great form is absolutely continuing and it actually may get her an invitation to the Augusta National Women's Amateur, which is absolutely huge. Like everyone's dream is to play Augusta. So fingers crossed for Lauren. We wish her all the best um, in all her achievements and fingers crossed we'll get to see her in Augusta because that is some achievement. But fellow Irish golfers, uh, Olivia Mehevi and uh, Julie McCarthy have already received their invitation to that tournament. So we will have some Irish representation even there, but it would be great to add one more to the ticket um, and just to see what happens. Niamh, you're going old school. You're going back to where it all started with you. You're returning to the swimming pool, but you yourself are not. You're bringing us back to swimming. What's happening in swimming these days? I would love a little trip to the swimming pool at the moment, but sure luck, I suppose uh, <laughs> we're all in, in current uh, COVID restrictions, so that'll have to have to be put off. But um, yeah, Mona McSharry was competing in the US. She is over there um, at university in Tennessee. So she competed in the 100 and 200 yard breaststroke. And she broke the school record set by Olympian Molly Hannes, who swam 528 uh, seconds in the, it was back in 2013. Um, Mona actually picked up silver in that event as well, which is very exciting. Um, and then she swam a PB in the 200 breaststroke and finished fourth, as well as picking up another silver medal in the 400 relay. Um, a little thing on this, um, as swimmers here, and I guess Europeans, we would be used to looking at the metric system. So uh, it is not a national record. Um, because if you look at like the online times and stuff, you would say, oh, like, that's a bit strange. Like that's a, the fastest time that Mona's ever swam, but it's actually yards yeah, versus meters, um, which is quite difficult when you start to go and look on social media. And there's uh, a lot of people will automatically default to meters from swimming because that's what we're used to and that's what the international competition is. But you kind of have to get used to the fact that she is racing the US and they still have 25 yard pools and 50 yard pools and that type of thing. Um, so to put it into context, 100 yards is actually 91.44 meters. So we are just shy of nine meters in the difference uh, when it comes to a, a hundred yard event. And um, yeah, sorry, hundred yards versus hundred meters. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's really good. It's great to see that she's on form. Um, you might see some more confusing content come out around that from different uh, from different organizations because I know it is, it is a kind of difficult one to figure out. Um, if you're just getting times thrown at you and you don't know if it's yards or meters, but um, yeah, look, she's um, over there. She's settling in. Um, I know that Ellen Walsh will be joining her soon. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll have some more swimming news soon because I think people are going to start to return to competition um, in Europe. 
hopefully very shortly. Um, as far as I am aware, the Olympic trials are in April. Uh, I might be wrong, but head over to your sport if you want the actual date. Um, but yeah, it's, it's coming soon. Um, I'm pretty sure it's April though. But um, there's been a lot going on in relation to COVID restrictions and stuff changing. Um, give us the update on that. Well, initially this podcast is going to be out of date because Michal Martin is going to come out and actually reveal all to the nation um, on Tuesday evening. So by the time you may listen to this podcast, this may all be out of date. So please bear with me um, when I am telling everyone what is going on in the world. So there's a uh, good optimism within the GA circles at the minute that we may be going back to elite. I love how I said we, that was total culture moment right there. But the, <laughs> GA, <laughs> but the GA may be coming back as um, elite. Obviously, we know at the start of the year, they were ready to go with camps, uh, with preseason um, and everything going on. And then the government communicated to them, actually, no, you cannot because you are not elite. And the GA did not realize that, that they had to reapply for their elite status. They kind of thought they had it all locked. We discussed that last week. You can listen to Maeve's rant and me sitting there as the innocent culture trying to deflect all blame. Um, but we should know this, obviously, by the end of the day. GA President John Horan said he is not going to be rushing into competition or even into pre preseason training camps, um, especially while the numbers are still high at the minute. He's also said that every team will be given a four week uh, base to start training first and then it will work from there. So by my maths and never trust me when I do maths, but according to everyone else in the Irish Times who've also done the maths for me, we should be seeing action probably in the league in May um, if all goes well with COVID numbers um, and different things like that. We also have Fine Gael Senators calling for exception to the 5k travel limit for golfers and sea swimmers. Never say that Fine Gael is not the party for all um, because um, everyone knows what has been picked up during this lockdown, which has been golfing and sea swimming at the minute. Um, I think basically it was just, I don't know, was it tongue in cheek? I don't know what to take anymore from Fine Gael, seriously. Whatever they just say, I smile and nod. They're like the grandparents in the corner that you go, that's lovely. Um, <laughs> Um, golfers are obviously giving out as well because they have seen pictures of parks absolutely packed and golf courses have been quiet I'm not going to lie Niamh I really do don't get the whole golf. I know I'm a golf fan and that's grand but I don't get why people think golf is a COVID hotspot like it's probably the only place where you are constantly I would not even say five kilometers I would say or five feet I would say you are five kilometers away from your partner like all mm -hmm. the time bar at the team you're not sharing anything you can't really like drink on the course it's a bit illegal you're not really supposed to um you're not allowed obviously touch any of the buggies or different things like that that's understandable you have to slum it across the golf course so i hope the Fine Gael senator will uh, talk about that um but you know i just i don't really understand it i don't get i look look everyone go to the park you know the ga pitch is open mm -hmm. here in the street because it's in a town park um and the actual playground for the children is open as well again it's under council rules so it's not under the ga umbrella before people freak out um but i think it's just kind of weird that i can stand in the playgrounds with my nieces and nephew licking things when they're not supposed to i would like to highlight they are four and three um when they're licking things and i look across and i see the pitch and put center closed I do mm -hmm. find it a little bit odd. Like, I'm not going to lie. I mean, the weather at the minute, I'm looking out my window. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I don't get it. Like, how are God's I think... Am I showing my... Um, what's I'm looking for? My, my prejudice here and my high and mighty class? I don't know. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's... I think it's... Um, it's fair to question it. Look, I think really what the government did um, and the way that I would see it is that they just uh, closed everything. Uh, all sports. And they just did across the board. There are lots of sports that have... Um, expected uh, that they would be able to to participate and then everything was just closed across the board they wanted to close the clubs um, there's lots of sports I think that could be run safely there are a number of sports that can kind of um, you know you can have people then individuals I know we mentioned um, you know with some of their own clubs last week that there were booking systems and uh, you know single boats like one person in the boat that's it I know that kind of is and um, the same in kayaking. I think there are other sports like golf absolutely can be um, run in a distance fashion. I think things like tennis, you can probably get a good plan there. I'm, I mean, there's lots of family units that play tennis. So how come they couldn't go and at least, you know, avail of the of the courts and stuff? I'm, 
I think there are a lot of sports out there that you you can figure out ways for um for things to go ahead. But what the government essentially just did was close everything because the cases were so high after Christmas, and they decided that they'd go as far as now and um, to change anything uh, rather than kind of reevaluating it. Um, I mean, look, the cases are still um anywhere from six hundred to I think it's just managing to stay under the thousand um mark at the moment. But you know, we've certainly gotten close to it um in the last week as well. But um, I think I understand where the golfers are coming from because if they're going around in ones and twos and they're able to distance and whatever it is and then you are looking at the park and I think it's not just, you know, the Phoenix Park or um, any of those, uh, the, the big parks around the country. It's lots of parks. People are going to wherever it's within their 5K and when you had weather like you did at the weekend, like Sunday in particular, was, was pretty reasonable. People want to be out. They've nothing else to do. So everybody goes to the same place. And then like literally the pictures that were on Twitter and there were golfers that were going ballistic and they were like, how come this is allowed? And uh, people don't distance enough when they're in the parks. Um, there's, everyone wants to walk on the path. It's fine. If you're happy to go cross country uh, through Phoenix Park, you probably manage to stay away from people. But if you're going to walk on the path, um, you are going to come in, 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 you're going to encounter other people. So to like get around them and stuff like you know, you'd want to have your walking boots on basically to, to be happy enough. Your walking boots, your wellies to be happy enough to walk in the muck and in the, in the kind of, you know, slushy grass and stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to change. Like, I think um, we'll see what happens. Sorry, my earphones are falling out. Um, we'll see what happens with the GA. And I think we'll know uh, from there um, what some of the rulings are going to be with the other sports. Um, obviously, we mentioned last week that uh, Philip Doyle had put up stuff previously about. Um, you know, GA going ahead or not. So I think they need to look at, I guess it was like way back, um, they need to look at what is the logical um, kind of progression as we move forward. And I know you spoke before about the fact that there was kind of testing done and the transmission outside and stuff is is not really happening. Um, but yeah, it's certainly disappointing for people at the moment as they have seemingly extended um you know, this lockdown with no end date in sight, um, I actually think it's frustrating people more and I think people might start to defy it more than to follow it um, because they're not really given a goal. You know, we talk yeah. about smart goals and stuff. Um, timeliness is one of the one of the pieces in a smart goal and um, there's no timeliness on, on this. And I know, look, I know it's difficult for them to, to put a date on it. And obviously the UK has said something like the 21st of June, um, but it just seems that if things keep going the way they're going, that people are just going to get more and more lax about the rules. I'm, I'm further disappointed. But look, we have some better news. Uh, um, well, I was going to say, before you go on, Liam, and you're yeah. talking about Phoenix Park and cross country, one thing that I want to die along with COVID-19 is couples walking on footpaths and you having to either step onto oncoming traffic or step into a field of someone you do not own because the couple refuses to break hands and move on. I don't see that happening on the golf course. So I would like the golf course to be open so I could do that without knowing I don't have to step into oncoming traffic <laughs> because the couple refuses to stop holding hands. It's like, it's 2021. We don't want hand holding. There's a global pandemic with touch and spit. Don't do it. Just break hands and let someone pass. That's yeah, all I yeah. want to say on that subject. Well, I think, look, I think the other piece is like they, there's a lot of people trying very hard and then there's a few people that just don't really care. And I know from, say, my own family perspective that like my grandparents and I'm a sister of my grannies have told me of their experiences where they've been trying to get out, you know, for their little walks and um, have actually ended up being the person in the grass because the younger people won't move out of their ways, which isn't great either. Like you should be kind of... I don't know, respect your elders, like, uh, within within some extent, like, you have to understand, and, like, if you're a young person, you're probably a bit more able to stand in the grass, and that some of these older people may not get going again, um, and to just kind of give them a bit of wide berth, but, yeah, certainly, certainly the, the great aunt of mine was not impressed by some of the behaviour of the local youths, who would not move out of the way, went herself, and um, my granddad were gone for a walk, so, and he'd have a... a Thing on wheels as well do you know what I mean so you have to right. move it yeah you have to move it yeah. like if the wheels aren't going to go on the grass very well so like give the man no. a chance so he's very shuffly give him a chance <laughs> anyway we move on from that we promised some uh, news which we actually should have said at the start but 
Um, I know we t- ask people to send us over some news of what they've been doing in their local clubs and stuff. Um, we've had a lot of people send in to us that they are doing circuits online, they're talking to their friends and their um, clubmates that way. There have been quizzes, uh, there's been team challenges. Um, I know we mentioned Swim Ireland's um, Smartest Family. I think that's actually kicking off this week. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of different things that are going on. Um, have you heard anything of note uh, in different clubs or has there been anything in your community that's been a creative way to keep people motivated or um, positive um, during this time, I suppose? Well, Leave, what's very concerning for me is that there are a lot of clubs contacting me saying, can you please do a talk for our children who are suffering during this incredible time? And I have to think, and my dad said it to me, he was like, how bad is this global pandemic that we have to turn to you, Joanne, for advice? And I thought that was very nice the way he put it. Um, But I actually was on a call uh, with Terman GA up in Donegal uh, on Sunday night. Uh, Keen listeners to the Her Sport podcast, they told me it's just sport. So they were very buzzed to see me online. Um, and to talk about the podcast and everything that I do, because a lot of them were interested in getting involved in media. Uh, but I think really for a lot of clubs, it's to get uh, a bit more imaginative, to get a bit more creative. Um, their club recently got a gift of, oh no, some other club, my bad, not Sherman. Um, another club got a gift of, um, I don't know if you saw it on Instagram, like the ball, it's like strapped to your chest and you can do like soloing with it and kick it bar. And, okay, and like, cool. there's a there's like a bungee cord attached to the ball mm-hmm. and the ball will spring back into your chest for you. So it's just to help uh, anyone really with their um, with skills. their uh, skills and hand-eye coordination, I suppose, more importantly than anything else. Um, so things like that are obviously flying out the door, different creativity, absolutely, for yeah. sure. Um, one thing I am noticing is there's a lot of um, online, uh, there's a lot of GA stars online coming out doing more ball-to-wall uh, mm-hmm. throwing techniques. Um, one thing uh, the Donegal Ladies Football uh, Twitter account was putting up was uh, little posters of how to do basic skills. So you'd print the poster, you'd hang it up, and then you'd recreate it over and over and over again until you were really good at it. So different things like that are obviously popping up online. I do think the online coaching had kind of disappeared, like the you know the the humor was kind of gone for it, you know, for mm-hmm. a while. But I think actually people are still obsessed with it. Um, I'm not going to say I tried a few moves. I definitely didn't because I didn't want to humble myself in public. Um, but no, it's been very cool so far just to see the creativity by coaches. Um, but I think like everyone else, I think it's slowly waning a little bit. But um, yeah. yeah, it's been it's been really cool to see what all the other clubs have gotten up to. Um, a lot of them are hosting Zoom calls with other people, not just me. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. To guide them and give them info and kind of different things like that. Um, I know people I are using like- the opportunity to learn. Like, so, yeah, like exactly. people, I think a lot of people are doing like nutrition talks and um, that's what I'm saying with their with the younger athletes and kind of helping them develop that. And um, I actually did see that Trinity rowing and Trinity hockey were kind of doing a bit of a head to head competition. So that's a bit of fun. Um, yeah, it's just like, honestly, I think people are just looking to, to you know, keep in touch. I, without obviously being in touch you know virtually keeping in touch that's but, literally um, the big thing at the minute like yeah. I mean the clubs don't even notice that I'm there sometimes they're just like oh John haven't seen you in so long like how's it going um, and that's lovely like even for me to see look I'm not obviously a member of these clubs whatsoever I don't know what's the scandal and what the lowdown and the gas is but by god after an hour and a half very little I'd imagine I come away Neve. I'm telling you and I feel like I know the entire town and who's having what baby and who's going out with who oh, and, sure. and things like that I get all the gas honestly it's great but no it is just a lovely way to interact with um, other teams and different things that are going on as you said Mm -hmm. it is a form of creativity and I think more importantly for the young athletes coming up it's to also show them that sport isn't necessarily everything there are other things going on in life that you will have to dabble with and experience um, in order to get through it so um, yeah I know I mentioned her sport and how uh, Termin GA and LGFA are officially on our bandwagon but Neve. You've got great news in other people who are on our bandwagon because we are, well, you guys are hitting some incredible numbers on YouTube and Twitter and everything. So you want to give us a lowdown on her sport? What's the crack? What's going on? We're not quite hitting the massive numbers on YouTube. Um, But when it comes to Instagram, we hit 20,000 last week during Instagram and I was very lucky to get a big zero uh, balloon. Um, so that was very exciting uh, for uh, for everybody that's involved in her sport and certainly thank you to the whole team that have helped us get this far and obviously the audience that tune in, like the content, engage with us um, and you know it's it's 
encouraging and inspiring for us to keep going. We have set a fun competition of sorts on Twitter. We are aiming for a thousand retweets. So we put out a tweet last night that said that we want to create a real impact um, for women's sports. So we are looking to hit a thousand retweets on this particular post. And we're going to do some exciting giveaways, which um, some of the lucky followers will um, get some of these prizes. Um, we are edging towards that 5,000 followers on Twitter. So if you don't follow us on Twitter already, um, let's push on. We are about 300 short. Um, and that's just one of the, the targets that we have at the moment. Um, YouTube is not that many followers. We do get the views on the podcast, which is exciting. Uh, we are slowly but surely making ground on 100 subscribers. So anyone that wants to subscribe to us on YouTube, that'd be great. And so, yeah, look, it's uh, YouTube is something that we've kind of newly moved into and put more focus on recently. And um, it's not the be all and all in, in matter of actually getting views, but it'd be really great to see that community grow and a target for YouTube. Although, yes, we now have the 100 subscribers as a target. Our long term goal with YouTube is a thousand. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit further, but basically when you have a thousand subscribers on YouTube, you're actually able to start generating some revenue, which is very important for us. I will go to the Her Sport Ambassadors before we get to the social enterprise perspective. So we have some exciting announcements um, in relation to the Her Sport Ambassadors. Uh, Baven Parsons is on board as a Her Sport Ambassador and we will be doing a exclusive interview with her this week. So be sure to tune in to It's Just Sport, a league of her own because we'll have Baven on this week and we're very excited to talk to her. And we also have the Big Strong Girls, the Irish rowing team on board as her sport ambassadors. And we have released some fun content on Instagram where you can get to know them a bit better. We have a this or that uh, video that we've just released. So you'll get to know some quirky things about the, the Irish rowing team. Um, so yeah, that's all, all fun and games. We're expanding our team. We're certainly talking to some more athletes about coming on board and helping us work towards a level playing field for women in sport. We'll go to a slightly more serious matter I guess the business side of things and really kind of what we're doing so um we've not really ever come out and talked about um what it's like to run a business what it's like to to do what we do um something that we certainly find challenging um at times is that um you know the the industry that we're in people just expect content to be free all the time and and it's not and um, the days are gone I think where people will go in and buy the newspaper every single day um my granddad is still doing it but he is 87 maybe 88 um but a lot of people now don't do it certainly not my generation and my like my mom would not go in and buy the newspaper anymore so a lot of people expect to be able to consume news on twitter consume it on instagram just google it and, and you know keep up to date that way and we don't really pay those publication companies anymore so in the same way um we don't have a paywall we don't have people paying us two euro to you know see our content every day or whatever that is so we're a small organization and we really want to make an impact in women's sport. But at the moment, from uh, from, from that perspective, we don't have people supporting us in, in that financial way. We obviously work on different campaigns and uh, that type of thing. So we do have revenue streams, but we really want to, I guess, connect with the community a little bit more and explain how you guys can help us. So there are two ways that you can help us. You can uh, help us in a free way. And tell a friend about us, follow our channels, subscribe to that YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, retweet that tweet, all those kind of things. They're free ways to help her sport gain more momentum, you know, help with the impact of what we're actually trying to do. But also more numbers for us means that we're more attractive to companies when we want to work with um, advertisements and, and that type of thing. So the numbers do help um, us in the long run. And it might seem like something small. And like by commenting on that Facebook post or, um, you know, commenting on our Instagram and really engaging, like all those little things really do help. From a financial perspective, if people are interested and if people really do like the content that we put out there, a financial uh, contribution would be really appreciated by the team. So I guess we have a piece on the website where you're able to go and make a donation and it can be anything from one euro to whatever you feel is appropriate. It can be once off donation, it can be something that happens monthly, but that fund goes directly to um, our team and it goes to paying our team for the content that they put out there. So from written content to video content, to the podcast, like all that type of things, like it helps us pay for the team to keep creating the content that you guys really love and putting it out there. But 
that's essentially just some small ways that we can do. Like we are a small organization, a social enterprise. People are here. We get so many comments saying, thanks so much for doing what you're doing. We really love your content. People are learning so much more about the Irish female athletes in the country. Um, I know that there's some, we've connected a lot of the elite athletes together. They're learning more about each other. We've actually connected some American athletes and some other European athletes together. So everybody's getting to know each other. So just to kind of get an understanding that uh, a lot of work goes into what we do. And so far, the we haven't asked people to pay for any of that content. So if you can help us in any way from a financial perspective, it would be much appreciated. But that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, it's just to kind of give people a, an insight and a, and a picture into, into what we're doing. But um, you know the, the the true ins and outs of it and, and the difficulty in the in the industry. Yeah, no, it's definitely tough. It's definitely tricky. I suppose I'm very like fortunate I'm backed by the big entity that is the Irish Times. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate in that regard, but I see all the work that has to go on you know, behind the scenes here at hersport.ie. Um, I'm incredibly fortunate to be part of such a cool team who've obviously taken a risk on me as a podcast host. I mightn't be that good of it. Um, but no, we're just getting there. We're, we're tipping away. And to be honest, I think for us, for myself and Eve anyways, um, it definitely is the tip of the iceberg. We want to deliver a podcast to you that is of a ridiculous quality um, that you would expect from the likes of other podcasts that focus on men's sports um, and kind of would focus on women's sports the odd time. We just want to be there for people to deliver the news to deliver the insights, to deliver everything that's kind of going on, while also bringing the best interviews and the best, um, it's not the best crack, I suppose, with the athletes that, you know, we want to see. Uh, we're very fortunate we're in such a cool time where these women athletes, they're, they are accessible, they are there for us, you know, if we need them. And for the younger ge generation coming up, I think it is so important. It's so cool, I think, to be a women in sports fan at this moment in time. When I was younger, as I tell everyone, my hero was Ronaldinho. I don't look like Ronaldinho. I've got a ponytail. I've got teeth. That's the closest thing I come to Ronaldinho. But definitely like at the grand old age of 24, um, I have a lot of heroes, you know, coming up through the field that are being so successful as Irish athlete, athletes um, at the minute succeeding on the biggest stages. And the fact that we can sit down, get to interview them, they're so ex like accessible in a good way to us. Um, it is hugely important to bring us all that content. Um, but more importantly, as you said, Neil, we do rely on clicks. We do rely on listens. Uh, we do rely on subscriptions and everything else in between. And these are all just the free ways that you can possibly um, connect to us. So, you know, as I always say, write a review, even if it's just, it's great, um, it's not great, uh, whatever it is you possibly want to write down, help us, you know, do it on Spotify, rank us on Apple Podcasts, uh, rank us on Anchor, um, do whatever it is you need to do. Um, my brother in Sweden has us open on three, uh, on an iPad, a laptop and an iPhone. So he was like, I swear to God, if you're not getting any forms of clicks from the Swedes over here, I'm going to be very disappointed. <laughs> but we really do appreciate all the help and everything that we can possibly do. Um, I suppose for context with your money, we can put together um, really cool events. We can put uh, product producers behind the scenes to help us out a little bit better than what we do and to maybe control some of our rants and to rein us in every once in a while. Um, but I think also it just allows us to give women in sports the correct platform it deserves in order to thrive. And I think that for me is the most important thing. So if you missed out to follow us on social, it is at hersport.ie on Twitter, at joanneor underscore ox, and at hersport.ie on Instagram, and at joanneor on Instagram. And we're constantly tagging each other and having good crack at the end of it. <laughs> um, I know I just did a poll over the weekend and Niamh is on track when COVID is over. So our <laughs> next AFLW output. If you haven't listened to our interview with Michael Cran of AFLW, feel free to check that out. Niamh, even though you might be dead in six weeks from the AFLW, it's great talking to you. And uh, yeah, I hope you had a good time, Niamh. I had a great time. You too. Yes, we definitely hit a lot today. It was a busy day, but I think we got through it all for everybody. So again, be sure to tune in on Friday when we release the new interview on Ali of Her Own with Babe Parsons. So thank you all for listening. And that is it for today. Cheerio.